Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. This is part two of our regular installment of our Unearthed series, where we talk about things that have been literally and figuratively unearthed over the last few months. Today's episode is going to have the books and letters, a lot of fashion and cosmetics-related stuff, a whole lot of medical finds, some shipwrecks, and of course, uh, we are going to start where we often start in part two, which is stuff that doesn't really go into a good category, which I call potpourri. So back in October, police in Northern Ireland were notified of a body that appeared to be that of a teenage boy. This has turned out to be not a recent murder victim, but a bog body that's roughly 2,000 to 2,500 years old, now nicknamed the Balahi Boy. His cause of death is unknown, but officials were reportedly astonished that this wasn't the victim of a recent crime. Some of the skin was intact and described as pink, not as the leathery brown look that folks often associate with bog bodies. This body was found on land owned by the Department of Agriculture, and it was sent to National Museums Northern Ireland for further study. The whole area was treated as a crime scene, and then they were like, oh, it's not... This is not a crime, though. Uh, At least not a crime that happened. The statute of limitation and this is over for bog bodies. If it was a crime, the person that did this crime is long gone. Yes. So next, in January, a crew dredging the Vistula River in Poland pulled up a medieval-era sword. Uh, This has a very long blade and a pommel that's shaped sort of like a knot, and there's an inscription along the blade that looks like the name Ulfbert. There have been at least 170 other swords discovered that have this inscription, so, you know, it's believed to maybe be the name of the sword maker or some other identifying mark. This is a Frankish name, and these swords were made in Western Europe in what's now northern France, but most of them have been found in Scandinavia. So a lot of sources are describing this as a Viking sword. A tsunami may have struck part of Northern Europe 8,000 years ago, based on research done through the University of York. This tsunami would have followed an underwater landslide known as the Stroga, which happened near Norway, with the resulting tsunami striking the coast of what's now Northumberland. There was already archaeological evidence suggesting that the population of this region declined sharply around this time, and this could provide an explanation of why. The population of the island of Great Britain was very small, and most people in this area were living along the coast, so the death toll and impact on settlements would have been severe. Moving on, a metal detectorist found a 300-year-old thimble under a tree in Pembrokeshire, Wales, back in November of 2020, and that thimble has now been declared a treasure. The thimble is highly decorated. It was made in two pieces, and it's covered in a zigzag pattern with an inscription that reads, like still and love ever, around the bottom. I love that sentiment, and I also love how it is spelled, because like is L-Y-K-E and still only has one L on it. I love it. The UK's Treasure Act of 1996 requires items declared to be treasures to be offered for sale to museums. The fate of this thimble was not certain when we recorded this, but the Tenby Museum and Art Gallery, which is not far from where the thimble was found, has expressed interest in it. And lastly, a Roman dodecahedron has been found in England during a dig at the Lincolnshire village of Norton Disney. About a hundred of these 12-sided objects, most of them with little knobs on the corners, have been found across Europe, with more than 30 of those in Britain. These Roman dodecahedrons have been the subject of a number of viral videos claiming that they were used to knit gloves and that dummy dumbhead historians would know that if they just talked to some knitters. Uh, However, only some of these have the holes that are involved in using them to knit gloves, and a lot of them just aren't the right size for that purpose. Plus, these dodecahedrons date back to between the 1st and 3rd century CE, and the oldest knitted objects found so far come from Egypt around the 11th century CE. 
This is a bit tricky since items made from natural fibers decay and they aren't often preserved in the archaeological record. But we're talking about as long as a thousand years between when these dodecahedrons were made and when knitting is believed to have developed. We do, by the way, have a whole episode on the history of knitting for folks who would like to know more. That was a Saturday classic in January 2021. Anyway, this one is about the size of a grapefruit. And like the others, it's not conclusively known exactly what it was for. There aren't any references to these objects in surviving Roman texts, and some of the possibilities that have been proposed include that they were toys or were used for some kind of a game or that they had a religious purpose or that they were ammunition for weapons like slings, basically Anything you can think of that something shaped like this could be used for, someone has suggested that could have been the use. A giant dice game. They are really cool looking. I understand why people are fascinated with them, but the videos implying that historians are stupid for not knowing they were used for knitting gloves, they irritate me. (laughs) We're going to move on to books and letters. And this first one came from a tip from a listener, and our apologies because we didn't note which listener. Uh, Fragments of an 11th century Latin Psalter have been found within the bindings of other books. This Psalter also contained Old English glosses, or word-for-word translations. Pieces of this Psalter were used as reinforcing materials sometime around 1600, and a number of other pieces of it have been found before. Yeah, the materials needed to bind books were very expensive. So repurposing books and the materials from the books into other books, super common. A newly published paper on this looks at multiple pieces of this Psalter that have been found, including eight end leaf guards and 13 strips that were used to line the spines of other books. So 21 total fragments of this Psalter. It's possible, but not definite, that this was a Psalter that belonged to an English princess named Gunhild who fled to Bruges after the Norman conquest of 1066. She is known to have had a Psalter, which she donated to a church, and it would have made sense for this Psalter to have been in Latin with Old English glosses. Next, a group of students has used AI to try to translate scrolls that were carbonized during the eruption of Vesuvius in the year 79 CE. Scrolls that are much too fragile to try to unroll and read by any other means. This was part of a competition called the Vesuvius Challenge at the University of Kentucky. And these students won the competition's grand prize after deciphering several passages from a three-dimensional CT scan that had recently been made of one scroll. This added up to about 5% of the total text in that scroll, which maybe doesn't sound like much, but this was meant to be more of a proof of concept than an attempt to decipher the whole thing. Also, that's more than we had before. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) One of the students was also part of another similar project last year. Yeah, before we knew zero, because if we tried to unroll it, it would fall apart. So this kind of work might be able to allow researchers to read scrolls that really could not be read otherwise and thus preserve knowledge that would otherwise be lost. But there are some concerns about this kind of work. Uh, Aside from debates about AI, which, as I understand this, the AI was more about, like, recognizing what's text and what's not, not on coming up with what the words were. Like, it wasn't a predictive model of the text, as I understand it. Anyway, uh, many of these scrolls were found under the remains of Herculaneum, which is surrounded by populated neighborhoods today. So if additional excavations were done to look for more scrolls like these, they would probably go underneath houses that are currently occupied. And some of the residents of these homes worry about whether that kind of work could destabilize the foundations of the neighborhood. Next, it's possible that researchers have found the oldest known runes in Denmark on the blade of a 2,000-year-old iron knife, which were only visible after the blade was cleaned and conserved. Engraved into the blade is the word hirilla, which means small world. These runes are about 800 years older than the yelling rune stones, which we have covered on the show before. Next, new radiocarbon dating suggests that the Rongo Rongo script used on the island of Rapa Nui was developed before the arrival of Europeans on the island. 
This came from a tablet currently held in a collection in Rome that was dated to between 1493 and 1509, which was more than 200 years before the first European arrivals on the island. While it is possible that this script could have been engraved into a very old piece of wood later, it doesn't necessarily seem likely that there would have just been an ancient piece of wood to have this engraved on it. Even though Rongo Rongo doesn't resemble European written languages at all, there has been an argument that it was developed because of the influence of Europeans, partly because Europeans didn't notice it was being used there until 1864. Also, as a note, there aren't many examples of this script today, and none of them are on Rapa Nui. They're all in collections elsewhere. Moving on, a 3,300-year-old tablet was found in central Turkey last year, and it has now been deciphered. This tablet is about the size of a person's palm, and the writing on it is in cuneiform. This seems to describe an invasion during a Hittite civil war, with the invaders being one of the warring factions of Hittites. Next, back in the late 18th century, bricklayers working at the Shakespeare House in Stratford-upon-Avon found a religious tract hidden in the rafters. It contained the name J. Shakespeare and has long been believed to have belonged to William Shakespeare's father, John. It's a translation of an Italian text called The Last Will and Testament of the Soul. It's sort of a religious pledge that a person could sign their name to. Research into lots of different surviving copies and translations of this text has led to the conclusion that it was actually written after John Shakespeare died. The only other J. Shakespeare it could have belonged to is William Shakespeare's younger sister, Joan, about whom we know very little. This document contains references to dying a good Catholic death, which is notable since at that point, England had become a Protestant nation where Catholics weren't allowed to openly practice their faith. And lastly, researchers have found a potential solution to preserving ancient papyri that are contaminated with fungus, and that is exposing them to wasabi vapors. Researchers created mock copies of painted and unpainted papyrus and then exposed them to fungi. Exposure to wasabi vapor completely eliminated the fungus in the painted and unpainted copies without damaging the papyrus. So you're preserving all of your stuff and clearing out things when you eat a lot of wasabi is my takeaway. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. uh, I did not look far enough into it to know what led them to say maybe if we expose this to wasabi vapors, but I love it. Uh, We are going to take a quick sponsor break, and then we're going to talk about some stuff related to fashion and cosmetics. Okay, next we have a bunch of finds that are related to the overall ideas of beauty, fashion, and cosmetics. First, in Wales... One discovery is a Roman ligula. This is a silver spoon with a tiny, tiny bowl and a long, thin handle that was used to remove things like perfume, makeup, or other similar substances from long-necked bottles. Most sources describe this as a toilet spoon, with toilet meaning the act of grooming, not the thing in the bathroom where someone empties their bladder or bowels. The first article I read about this find did not explain that about the name until very far down in the text, and I was very confused. (laughs) Normally, these little spoons had straight handles, but this one has become bent at some point. It measures about 2.5 inches or 6.3 centimeters long, with the bowl having a diameter of only 0.2 inches or 5 millimeters. These spoons were more commonly made out of copper alloy, and it's possible that the ones made from silver were used for medical purposes because of silver's natural antimicrobial properties, so removing medical preparations from jars rather than cosmetics. A vial of what was most likely lip pigment was found in southeastern Iran back in 2001 after flooding unearthed a number of objects from ancient burial sites. And this has now been described in a paper that was in the journal Scientific Reports. 
This vial was about 4,000 years old, and the pigment in it is a very deep red, and it was made primarily from minerals like hematite, manganite, and braunite, along with some traces of other materials, all in a base of wax and other organic substances. This is one of the oldest discoveries of its kind, but it has a pretty similar formulation to modern mineral-based makeup. The container holding the pigment is also very finely crafted, made from a greenish chlorite and decorated with patterned incisions. Next, a 3,000-year-old dress fastener was found by a metal detectorist in Staffordshire, England, one of only seven such fasteners ever found in England and Wales. It's shaped almost like a set of finger symbols connected by a string, although the whole thing is made of gold, so you couldn't clap those two ends together without bending or breaking it. It would have been used to hold a person's cloak, skirt, or dress together. This item was probably made in Ireland. Irish metalsmiths of this era were known for their gold work. Another fastener that made news in recent months was a medieval belt loop found in Poland. This would have been used to hang someone's keys or a pouch from their belt, and it was found by a metal detectorist, and it depicts a stylized human figure attached to a rectangular mount. And that mount is what would have been used to to slide the loop onto a person's belt. Next, we have a couple of garments that were just sort of found in boxes. One is a ceremonial robe that would have been used by the Emperor of China in the early 19th century. It was in a cardboard box tucked in the back of a drawer after being purchased by Eric Hyde Villiers as a gift for his father in 1913. The Villiers family is an aristocratic family with roots that stretch back to Barbara Villiers, who had five children with King Charles I. Because this robe was in a box that was protected and unopened for so long, it's very well preserved. It's made from gold and blue silk, decorated with 12 astronomical symbols and dragon imagery. This is the type of robe that would have been worn for twice yearly festivals at the Temple of Heaven, and it is planned to be auctioned off in May. The other item is a sweater that was found in a parcel that was shipped from Torjon in the Faroe Islands to a recipient in Copenhagen, but it was seized by the British Navy during the Second Battle of Copenhagen and never made its way to its destination. The ship's captain was unaware that a war had started when setting sail from port. The sweater was made from very bright red wool. It is still very bright, and it has a black and red floral pattern. This was accompanied by a letter in Danish, which read in part, quote, My wife sends her regards. Thank you for the pudding rice. She sends your fiancé this sweater in the hopes that it is not displeasing to her. This charming discovery was part of the Prize Papers Project, which is an effort to catalog and study an enormous amount of mail that was seized by the British Royal Navy over a period of almost 200 years. There's so much unopened mail that is <laughs> just floating looked around. at as part of this project. Uh, all the rest of our fashion finds are about some kind of jewelry. First, a medieval love badge has been found in Gdansk, Poland, during restoration work at a 15th century port. This restoration work involved foundation work at the port's crane, and that crane is the oldest surviving port crane in Europe. This badge is shaped like a turtle dove, and it's carrying a banner that reads Emor Vincit Omnia, or Love Conquers All. Back in 2020, a 1,500-year-old ring was found in Emmerly in southern Denmark. But the find wasn't announced until now to allow for additional metal-detecting work to take place at the site where it was discovered. This ring is made from gold with an oval garnet with four spirals underneath the mount. Like the sword that we mentioned earlier, this was probably Frankish in origin and worn by someone high up in the Merovingian dynasty. This find seemed to surprise researchers because this kind of ring typically would have belonged to somebody of very high rank, and gold was often used as a diplomatic gift. But nobody of the rank who would be likely to have this ring is known to have lived in the area at the right time. An easy explanation would be that some important person lost it while they were traveling, But there are other objects found in the area that suggest that somebody very powerful might have actually been living there. We just don't currently know who. 
And lastly, archaeologists in Turkey have found more than 100 ornamental objects dating back to about 11,000 years ago that were likely worn as jewelry in body piercings. These were made of a range of materials, including limestone, obsidian, and river petals, and about 85 of the objects are complete. Based on their designs, it's likely that they were worn in ear or lower lip piercings. There have also been human remains found in the area with wear on their lower teeth that would likely have happened while wearing lip jewelry. These offer the earliest documentation of this kind of body modification in Southwest Asia. Next, we are moving on to another subject, which is medicine. And there are so many medical finds. First, there was a lot of coverage of studies documenting ancient people with a number of different genetic differences. The first of these came through work with the Thousand Ancient British Genomes Project. Researchers in the UK found evidence of someone with Mosaic Turner Syndrome who lived about 2,500 years ago, as well as someone with Jacob Syndrome who lived in the early medieval period, and three people with Kleinfelter syndrome who each lived in different years. So in Mosaic Turner syndrome, someone has one X chromosome without a second X or Y chromosome. Jacob's syndrome involves having an additional Y chromosome, or XYY. And Kleinfelter syndrome involves having an additional X chromosome, or XXY. This work followed development of new computational methods meant to pick up more variation in the X and Y chromosomes in ancient DNA. We don't really know much about the lives of the five total people discussed in this research who lived over a span of time about 2,500 to 250 years ago. But it does seem as though they were buried according to the typical customs of the society they were living in. Rick Schulting, professor of scientific and prehistoric archaeology at the University of Oxford, also noted this in a press release, quote, The results of this study open up exciting new possibilities for the study of sex in the past, moving beyond binary categories in a way that would be impossible without the advances being made in ancient DNA analysis. Researchers at the Max Planck Institute have also been working with ancient DNA and have identified six people who likely had Down syndrome. Five of them lived between 5,000 and 2,500 years ago, and the sixth lived in the 17th or 18th century. This conclusion is based on the fact that these six people had an unusually large number of genetic sequences connected to chromosome 21, which could really only be explained by their having an additional copy of that chromosome. One type of Down syndrome is called trisomy 21 and occurs when someone has three of that chromosome rather than two. These researchers also found evidence of one person with Edwards syndrome, or trisomy 18. Similarly to the previous study, we don't really know much about the lives of these people. And in the case of these, they were sadly very brief. Uh, One of the people with Down syndrome lived to be about a year old, and the rest died before that point. Down syndrome is connected to some heart problems and other issues that typically would have been fatal without access to modern medicine and surgery, but in a lot of cases are very treatable today. But all of these people were also buried with care in accordance with their people's traditions and burial practices, sometimes with some special items with their graves, such as bead necklaces or seashells. Another ancient DNA study has suggested an origin point for the autoimmune disease multiple sclerosis. According to research published in the journal Nature, Herders who migrated to Europe from Western Eurasia carried a genetic variant that is connected to MS. This migration happened roughly 5,000 years ago, and according to this research, these variants became more prevalent over time, leading to an increased disease risk today. Three other papers published in Nature took a similar look at evidence for diabetes and Alzheimer's in ancient hunter-gatherer populations. If you're thinking, wasn't there also research about the Black Death increasing the prevalence of MS? Yes, that was different work a couple of years ago, which we covered on Unearthed back when it happened. Uh, In yet more DNA research, because there was a lot this time, it seems as though a genetic resistance to malaria developed in Eastern Arabia around the same time that agriculture developed there, 
and agriculture would have helped create an environment that would have been home to a lot of mosquitoes, which, of course, spread malaria. This research involved the remains of four people who lived in what's now Bahrain, somewhere between 300 BCE and 600 CE. Analysis of prehistoric bone has revealed what may be the oldest known incidence of tuberculosis, which in this case was in Neanderthals. This is also the first time tuberculosis has been discovered in Neanderthals. This discovery came from bones dating back to about 35,000 years ago in Central Europe. In addition to what this adds to the body of knowledge about tuberculosis, it has also raised speculation about whether tuberculosis infections might have contributed to the extinction of the Neanderthals. Next, research on a skeleton dating to about 2,000 years ago has added a piece of data to the ongoing questions about the origins of syphilis, One widely held belief has been that sexually transmitted syphilis was introduced to Europe after Columbus's voyages to the Americas and other journeys to the Americas by Europeans. But there's also some data to suggest that a similar illness was already circulating in Europe before that point. This research involved a skeleton that had been found in Brazil, 2,000 years old. It did show evidence of a syphilis infection. This is the oldest conclusive evidence of syphilis so far, but it is not a strain of syphilis that would have been transmissible through sexual contact. Researchers in Canada have developed a method to test for anemia in ancient remains, something that hasn't really been possible before since there's typically no blood to analyze. This work came from anthropologists at McMaster University and the University of Montreal working with a hematologist. They found that living anemia patients had microscopic gaps in their sternum and that those could be detected in bones from archaeological sites. This discovery should allow researchers to determine how prevalent anemia was in the past, which could contribute to the understanding of anemia today. And lastly, archaeologists have found a hollow piece of bone in the Netherlands, one that dates back to the Roman era about 2,000 years ago, which was used as a container for seeds, specifically black henbane seeds, which are poisonous but were also used for medicinal and ceremonial purposes, Seeds like these have been found at archaeological sites before, but this is the earliest example of a time that they've been found in a container, suggesting that they were being kept for some kind of medical or ceremonial use. Everybody loves shipwrecks. (laughs) They're Uh, coming next. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to take a quick sponsor break, and then we will get into shipwrecks. For some shipwrecks, we have talked about the shipwrecks from the Franklin Expedition a few times on the show, and there is a whole episode on Franklin's lost expedition. The most recent dives to the wrecks of the Erebus and the Terror took place in September of 2023, and then reports on those latest dives were released earlier this year. The team was able to make 68 dives while wearing heated diving suits. During these dives, the team was able to access a seaman's chest that they had been hoping to be able to get to for years. They also brought up a lot of tools, coins, and personal items. But crews also noted that the condition of the wrecks is changing dramatically because of climate change. The Erebus in particular is in much shallower water and faces greater threats from changes in the currents and stronger storms that are connected to the shifting climate. Also in Canada, a shipwreck washed up on the shore of J.T. Cheeseman Provincial Park in Newfoundland in February, possibly after being dislodged from the ocean floor by Hurricane Fiona. This was a 30-meter or 100-foot-long ship believed to date back to the 19th century. This wreck was really not in a spot that was suitable for research. The sea can really just pound on that area And this led to a scramble to document as much as possible before the wreck was damaged or pulled back out to sea by the tides. A team was able to retrieve some pieces of this wreck to be analyzed in a lab, so we may know more about it later. 
we've got a couple of World War I shipwreck discoveries. Divers have recovered the bell from the USS Jacob Jones, which was sunk off of Sicily after being torpedoed by a U-boat on December 6, 1917. It was brought to the surface due to the threat of looting at the site. Also, a team with the Unpathed Waters Project has identified the location of the SS Hartdale, which was torpedoed on March 13, 1915. The Hartdale had been carrying cargo from Scotland to Egypt. There was some information available about the possible location of this wreck from both surviving crew members and the log of the U-boat that had sunk it, making the ID required sonar work combined with documentary evidence. A wreck discovered in 2022 has been identified as the SS Nemesis, an iron-hulled steamship that was lost at sea off the coast of New South Wales, Australia in 1904 while carrying a load of coal. There were 32 people on board who lost their lives when the ship went down in a storm. Marine survey company Subsea Professional had originally spotted this wreck, and the identification came after an inspection with a remotely operated vehicle and some detailed mapping of the seafloor there. The whole length of this wreck has also now been surveyed with a drop camera. Last year, the Michigan Shipwreck Research Association discovered the wreckage of a steamship in Lake Michigan. And earlier this year, they announced that it was the wreck of the Milwaukee. The Milwaukee collided with another ship, the Hickox, on July 9, 1886, due to poor visibility from dense fog and smoke. The only person killed in this wreck was the Hickox lookout, who was thrown overboard. The team used a combination of written records from the time, historical weather data, and remote sensing to find the wreckage, and then followed up with a remote-operated vehicle to document the site. And then another listener tip, which I again forgot to put down who sent it. Part of the schooner Ada K. Damon was uncovered on Steep Hill Beach at the Crane Estate in Ipswich, Massachusetts, possibly by a dramatic high tide that's colloquially known as a king tide. This wreck is 115 years old, and it sank in the Great Christmas Snowstorm in 1909. The Crane Estate is managed by an organization called the Trustees of Reservations, which invited the public to a shipwreck scholars program in March and April, something I would have gone to had I realized it was happening before recording this, at which point it was too late. (laughs) Moving on, research published in the journal PLOS One has documented five dugout canoes built between 5700 and 5100 BCE, found northwest of Rome at a site called La Marmata. These represent some of the oldest boats in the Mediterranean and provide evidence of trade over water this far back in history. The five canoes were built from four different types of wood, and some of their features are described as advanced, such as transverse reinforcements, and possibly the ability to be outfitted with sails or support floats. And lastly, a wreck off the Florida Keys has been identified as the HMS Tiger, which was a British warship that had to be abandoned after it ran aground in 1742, leaving its crew temporarily stranded. This wreck was found in 1993 in Dry Tortugas National Park, and the identification comes from an old logbook, one that described how the sailors aboard had tried to lighten the ship's load after it ran aground. Britain and Spain were at war when this ship ran aground. The ship had been stationed in the Keys during the War of Jenkins' Ear, something that Tracy swears we've talked about on the show before, but that she could not find in her outlines. Doesn't ring any bells for me, so I'm like, shrug. Um, (laughs) This war was interconnected with the War of the Austrian Succession. And now we are going to end this installment of Unearthed with three stories that I have looped together in a category that I'm just calling That's Wild, because they're not really related to each other, but they sure are, in my opinion, off the wall. First... A paper was published in the journal Archaeological Prospection last year in which an Indonesian geologist and several co-authors concluded that the site known as Gunung Padang had been built as a pyramid as long as 25,000 years ago. That would make it older than the Pyramid of Djoser. We've talked about the Pyramid of Djoser on the show before, and it is believed to be the oldest pyramid in the world. So if correct we would have a new oldest pyramid. 
This paper was immediately controversial, with critics arguing that its completely groundbreaking conclusions were flatly incorrect, and that instead the site was built on natural rock formations that have an appearance similar to a steppe pyramid. One rebuttal posted at the website Southeast Asian Archaeology read in part, quote, a good analogy is saying scientists have dated the soil underneath the Eiffel Tower and concluded that the tower is 20,000 years old. This led to a whole lot of back and forth and a lot of doubling down by the lead author until this paper was finally retracted in March, with the journal saying, quote, Following publication of this article, concerns were raised by third parties with expertise in geophysics, archaeology, and radiocarbon dating about the conclusions drawn by the authors based on the evidence reported. This whole thing was messy and public enough that it wound up on TikTok in a series by TikTok user Aerith Girl in her series Niche Tea, in which she talks about drama happening in communities that you may not be a part of. Next. Uh, last year, the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam uh, and the Pokemon Company launched a collaborative exhibit bringing together Van Gogh and Pokemon. Uh, Perhaps, unsurprisingly, this descended into chaos with tickets selling out instantly and visitors mobbing the gift shop. In particular, demand was a limited edition Pokemon card called Pikachu with gray felt hat showing Pikachu in the style of a Van Gogh painting, wearing a gray felt hat. It surprises me not at all that people were uh, relentlessly aggressive about getting this card. The (laughs) The exhibition launched in September, and by October, the museum had stopped offering the limited edition card because things had become so unmanageable. It's called underestimating the impact of your collaboration. (laughs) In January, it was announced that four museum employees who had previously been placed on leave had lost their jobs due to their conduct during the exhibition. This included someone who had worked for the museum for 25 years, who, according to reports, told visitors where they could get the cards, which was against the rules of the event and the museum's code of conduct. Another employee allegedly stole a box of these limited edition cards. Yeah, it was, as I understand it, supposed to be like a scavenger hunt. And so having an employee tell people where to go, uh, people thought was running afoul of the rules. I I have so many questions. I bet I have some of the same questions. Talk about in behind the scenes. Um, Finally, back in 2005, One of the original pairs of ruby slippers from the 1939 movie The Wizard of Oz was stolen from the Judy Garland Museum in Grand Rapids, Michigan in a smash-and-grab robbery. There was a huge search for the ruby slippers and an offer of a million-dollar reward, and the Grand Rapids Police Department recovered them in 2018. None of that seemed all that weird at the time, We've talked a lot on Unearthed about various stuff being stolen and later recovered, and sometimes people steal movie memorabilia. But then things got weird in the court proceedings of 76-year-old Terry John Martin, who pleaded guilty to stealing the slippers. News coverage has described him as a reformed mobster with a difficult past, doing one last score after 10 years away from his former life of crime. In January, his defense attorney filed a statement contending that Martin had stolen the slippers because he thought the rubies were real. He had planned to remove the rubies and sell them off individually so no one would be the wiser about where they had come from. He abandoned this plan when a fence brought him up to speed on the fact that the ruby slippers were decorated with sequins and glass. Uh, I have questions about this. So many. (laughs) Um... It does not appear that anyone tried to make any argument that he was not able to comprehend the crime, but it seems like a a person should be able to see that those are sequins on the shoes. Yeah. Uh, Martin, who was in hospice at the time, was ultimately sentenced to time served and a year of supervised release. And there's a plan to take these shoes on kind of a world tour before eventually auctioning them off at the end of this year. Ha ha, that is not the end of the weirdness. 
(laughs) In March, Martin's alleged accomplice, Jerry Hall Slitterman, was charged in conjunction with the crime. It is alleged that he received the slippers and took possession of them knowing that they were stolen. He has also been charged with witness tampering after threatening to release a sex tape of a woman who had knowledge of the case if she did not keep quiet. This just happened in mid-March. It is a wild ride, and it is still ongoing. Yeah, I feel like having just seen this sort of revenge porn aspect of it a couple of days ago (laughs) means probably something else is going to happen between today when we're recording this and when the episode comes out. 100%. So that's unearthed for the first three months of 2024. I have so many thoughts. Uh, (laughs) We'll talk about them Friday, Do you have listener mail? Yes. uh, We've gotten some extremely delightful uh, emails about a number of different subjects. This particular one is going to be about Robert Rules of Order. It is from Lisa. Lisa wrote and said... I listened to your episode about Henry Martin Roberts' rules of order. I also learned about these rules in a horse 4-H club. I've also been on fair boards, horse club board, and church councils, and all use these rules, some loosely and some formally. One of these clubs have a story you might find amusing. This club had in its rule book that all club meetings will follow Roberts' rules of order. Some members had their own agenda and started to bend these rules to manage this. My friend on this board and I did not agree with what they were trying to accomplish and used Robert's rules to right the ship. She worked as a court clerk and let me know that hanging out with lawyers had taught her a few things. She went to the library and checked out the biggest Robert's rules book she could find. Then she used two colored tabs and marked pages. One color was for the rules they were breaking and the other just made the book researched. When we went to the next meeting, after checking to make sure we knew for sure wording and the rules we understood were correct, we attended well-armed. As the meeting started incorrectly, she made a point of order and let them know that according to Robert's rules, while tapping the book, let everybody know the error. When it came to the topic we had issue with, and once again she tapped the book and let them know the problem. When she was told it was not a problem, I read from the club rules how we were to follow Robert's rules, and she read the rule they were breaking. I'm sure by the time the meeting was over, everyone was tired of her tapping that very important book. Eventually, they got the changes made, but they were made correctly. Attached for pet tax, I have a pic of my black barn cat who showed up one day six years ago and has not left. She just moved in. My house cat is black and white with a big personality. My husband and I are both ham radio operators, and one day when I was using the mic for one radio, I looked over and saw my cat with a different mic and captured this cute pic I thought you both might enjoy. Thanks for doing what you do. Your podcast is one of the few my husband enjoys listening to with me, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa, for uh, this email. I did enjoy the Roberts Rules story. We may also have... Uh, other Robert's Rules stories later because some of them are quite fun. And I also love the picture uh, of this little, it looks like a tuxedo cat looking at the microphone. I have some similar pictures of my cats sitting in the little podcast studio. Also, I think I've mentioned before, Opal likes to uh, pull the noise-dampening foam off of the wall and make a little bed out of it. Um, so I have cute pictures of her next to the microphone as though she is a podcast host, but I also have pictures of her in a bed made of work for me to have to do later, putting it back together. And this is why I record in a closet with a door that shuts. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Uh, she does it while I'm sitting right next to her. She has no respect. Um, so thank you so much for that email. If you would like to send us a note, about this or any other podcast or at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. We're on some social media with the username Miss in History, like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Twitter is called X now, I guess. I keep saying Twitter. Uh, You can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever else you like to get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.